A very good afternoon to you and welcome to the Sunday Forum. I'm Canon Tricia Hillis and I'm the Canon Pastor here at St Paul's and it's my very, very great pleasure to introduce and to welcome our speaker for today, Margaret Silf. Now Margaret, as many of you will know, is a popular retreat leader and the author of many best-selling spiritual guides, guides for the spiritual journey. Margaret, I feel that I've already been with you, although we've only just met. Um, I think I've always feel like I've been with Margaret in the desert through reading The Way of Wisdom, which is an encouraging book. And also, I feel that I've been on a, f a seafaring adventure with you through this book, At Sea with God. And I personally am deeply grateful for all that you've opened up for so many of us who are hungry for God. Now today, Margaret is joining us to speak about what is faith. It's a deceptively simple title, but this petite yet profound book concerns some of the most gigantic questions that we can ask of God and of ourselves. It's very easy to get the impression that faith is only about creeds, about doctrines and about knowledge but what if faith is more about mystery than mastery? What if living in the mystery could allow us to shift our focus from religion to relationship, to relationship with the divine? Margaret will look at some of the illusions and the obstacles to faith and offer some suggestions about way, ways to find or to deepen or to come back to that mystery of faith. Margaret's going to be talking for about 40 minutes and then we'll have some time for conversation together, spurred by your own questions. And after that, you'll have a chance along with me, I think I'll be first in the queue, to buy copies of her books if you would like to. So would you please join me in welcoming Margaret to the Sunday Forum. Thank you very much, Tricia, and thank you for inviting me here today. And, oh, it's daunting, <laughs> a sea of people. Thank you for coming today. It's uh, you're very welcome. I'm welcoming you to your own place here. Thank you for welcoming me here. So, um, let's explore. The, the title, deceptively simple though it may be, of that little book was not my title. It was a title I almost didn't write. Darton, Longman and Todd asked me to write uh, the first in a series called Simple Faith and the title was to be Faith and I said to the editor who asked me, oh no, that sounds like a book that tells people what they would have to believe to be able to call themselves Christian, I'm not doing that and he said no, no, after we'd mellowed a bit over lunch he said Tell us about what faith actually, what it means to you to be a person of faith, basically. And uh, so I think that's really the question. What would it mean in today's world to be a person of faith? In a world where there's so much polarization uh, between people of faith and people of none, between people of different faith traditions, between people of different traditions within one faith tradition, and between people of faith and what I would call, with some respect, but not too much, the rampant atheists, the almost evangelical atheists who are determined to convert the world to their view. Um, I, if Mr. Dawkins is among us, which I very much doubt, apologies to any present, but um, uh, yeah, we live in a very divided world. What does it mean to be a person of faith? I, um, I would I start by sharing a story from that, that came my way, I don't know where from. You may know it, about a kind of, I suppose, a circus performer who did a high wire act over a, an abyss with no safety net. And he walked this high wire across this abyss and he entertained the crowds that way. 
And they came along and cheered him on and said, well, fantastic. And, and one day he decided he'd enhance the act a bit. So he brought a wheelbarrow with him. So he said to the crowds, today I'm going to push this wheelbarrow across the high wire. And they all cheered. And he said, do you believe I can do this? And they all said, yes, yeah, we believe you can do this. And then he said, okay, which of you is going to get in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> <laughs> and the, the moral behind that really is, it's easy to believe. It's not actually easy. We have to force ourselves. We have to do some intellectual acrobatics to do what uh, Alice in Wonderland calls believing six impossible things before breakfast. But it is possible to make our minds accept certain things that reason would rather question. It's, it's possible to assent to creeds and doctrines it's quite probable that most of us who do that do so with one finger crossed, with two fingers crossed, behind our backs. <laughs> I know I've not yet actually met any practicing Christians who really can honestly say all these things and really believe them. However, it's much, much harder to get in the wheelbarrow. And really, this man Jesus of Nazareth that we claim to follow asks only that of us to get in the wheelbarrow. And that takes place for me to a different level. And perhaps a few years ago now, I can remember the time when I moved from a head kind of believer to, a, a, well, from the, if you go back to the Latin of fides, the, the word, the root of the word faith, it actually means primarily not intellectual assent, but trust and Faith for me is going to be about trust. So that changes things rather radically. Um, so, and can faith, that, that kind of faith, be simple? Well, simplicity is an interesting concept. Let me put this to you at, the, at some risk of ruffling feathers along the line, but I'll risk it. If I look at the Gospels, I see the pattern of a man teaching and, and revealing the fullness of God's love in all sorts of ways, through healing, through teaching, through being present, through conversations, um, and telling stories, close to my heart, telling stories. And I see the pattern in that, that the people that he told the stories to, or, or moved among, or had conversations with, included the most simple, the, the least literate or the completely illiterate of his time, the completely unschooled, and the highest that, that degrees of education, the lawyers and the Pharisees and so on. He told his stories to all, but the powerful pattern that comes through the Gospels is the people who mainly got it were the people who didn't have the education. That doesn't mean some of the people who did have education didn't get it, but it's, it's not hard to get the meanings behind the parables, especially if you translate some of them into modern times. Things like the Good Samaritan. Who, who are the Samaritans today? The people that you really don't quite want to know. And then they're the very ones that go and do something really good for you or really stand up to be counted when it matters. You could translate things in all sorts of ways like that. So actually in the gospel, you get Jesus' message transmitted in a way that is simple to grasp, but impossibly hard to live, as I think you'd all agree. However, it's moved and morphed into institutional practices which Seen from the outside, I know it's not like this on the inside, but seen from, as, from an outsider's point of view, it seems you've got to go through a lot of hoops and learn a lot of stuff and 39 articles and however many bits of the catechism and goodness knows what all to actually get in. It's quite hard. See, you've got to do something, you've got to train, you've got to work at it. I can remember my confirmation classes when I was 13, and I enjoyed them, but it, you know, you had to do something. You had to decide whether you were going to buy into this and believe it. So in a sense, hard to join, but, and this is the bit that is a gross 
distortion of the truth, I know. Um, there are many who, up from looking at it from outside, would say, but once you're in, it's easy to live it. You just have to keep your nose clean and go to church on Sundays and do the right things. That is a distortion, we all know that, but it's easily understood why people might think that. So what happened? Can faith actually be simple? Um, that's like, I'll come back to that question, but just that distinction between, and I don't want to draw yet another distinction, but a distinction between people who would say they are people of faith, whatever faith, uh, right across the spectrum, and um, people who would say they are not. And one, I, I ask myself, what questions would we answer differently as people of faith to those who, who might think otherwise? Um, I'm not sure, I'd need to think this through a lot more because there are many more questions and I'm not sure it's an easy distinction. In fact, I'm sure it's not. But two questions that would be fundamental to my life of faith would be, where is my life centered? Or where do I want my life to be centered? In me and my ego self, or in a deeper center, a deeper center of gravity? People of faith, of all faiths, know that they desire and are conscious of the fact that their lives are held from a deeper center not just their own ego self. Now that's also true of people who wouldn't profess faith. It doesn't mean they're all ego egoists, not at all, but that question would be clear for a person of faith. I want my life to be centered in the mystery I call God, and I want my actions to be in alignment with that mystery. Um, and another question would be, does life have meaning? And here we go back to um, the Dawkins kind, kind of people um, who would say, no, it's completely random. The universe just happened to bring us here. I find that incredibly, I find that harder to believe than the six impossible things before breakfast. But um, the question of, of does my life have meaning? I think many people of faith would say, whatever the meaning is, and it's always going to be out of reach because uh, God's ways are not our ways. We are not with our human mentalities and um, abilities going to grasp the mystery of, of the eternal. If we could, it wouldn't be God. It would be something we'd fabricated ourselves. Um, but the fact that uh, we want to live our lives as if they have meaning means that actually we do try to live meaningful lives. If life has no meaning, why are volunteers going in droves to Western Africa to help Ebola patients. If life has no meaning, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just sit in Starbucks and drink your coffee? Lots of examples of people who are living the meaning as they go and making all of us see, wow, this, this gives you a glow inside and says, humanity is worth something, we're going somewhere. We're evolving into something more than we are now. So faith certainly says yes. It says yes to mystery, the mystery that we can't ever know. And it says yes to meaning. I want to live my life meaningfully, even though I don't yet grasp the fullness of what that meaning is. Uh, lots of ways in which we could unpack all that, but uh, I want to move on. Oh, well, fall off the end of the, the edge of the universe in 35 minutes time. But the question of simplicity, we are, one of the, the hallmarks of our lives in the Western world today is we are absolutely showered with, or suffocating, with clutter and excess, certainly materially, and sometimes I dare say even spiritually. With complications, the spirit, we, we know about the material excess, and if you don't know about material excess, walk along Oxford Street in the next four weeks and you'll find out. Um, just total overload. My two grandchildren, I, su I suggested to my daughter tentatively, are we robbing them of the experience of joy? The joy I felt when I unpacked my Christmas stocking, which had the same predictable six things in it every year for don't know how long, and yet every year, the joy of seeing the lights come on on Christmas Eve, not four weeks earlier, on the Christmas tree, and hearing those carols on Christmas Eve, joy. I don't see that now in my grandchildren because they just go from one parcel to the next. 
and I'm sad about that. But spiritually, we can overload ourselves too with complications, with theories, with obscure definitions that we don't understand ourselves. But we put them out there in jargon that nobody else understands either. Uh, just to illustrate what I mean, a story from my own daughter's childhood. I'm not sure how old she was. The more I think about it, the more I think she must have been a bit older than I thought. But I had it in my head that she was preschool at the time, but maybe that wasn't so, but certainly not more than about six. She was playing one day with an abacus, and she was shunting the beads along, and she was counting zero up to nine, fine. And then she suddenly got it that if you put a one in front of them, you could go from 10 to 19. Put a 2 in front, you could go from 2 to 29, 30 to 39, and so on. She was so thrilled with this discovery, you could have thought that you'd engendered a little Einstein. She was so over the moon. And I, I encouraged her, I said, yeah, and it can go on and on and on. And then when she got tired of messing with the abacus, she turned to me and said, Mommy, where does it all end? <laughs> And I said, because I didn't know what else to say, I said, well, we call it infinity. Well, if you've ever tried to explain infinity to a six-year-old, I, <laughs> I did my best, but she glazed over, and that was the end of the abacus for the afternoon. So she played with something else, end of story. But uh, three or four hours later, bedtime, and I read her a bedtime story, and I gave her a bedtime hug, tucked her in for the night, was about to switch the light off. And she sat up in her bed and she flung her arms around my neck and she said, Mommy, I love you past numbers. <laughs> and I've never ever forgotten that because I failed to describe infinity completely, but she got it. She got it better than anything I could have explained. Um, so yeah, faith can be simple, but not simplistic in the sense of fundamentalist, which just take, puts, in my view, puts a ring around a certain bit of the doctrines and says, that's it, and if you're in there, you're on the safe island, and if you're not, you're out of it. I've, that's not my scene. Um, so it's not simplistic, but simple in the sense of being able to live in mystery and being okay living in mystery without trying to get certainty for ourselves in our own sense of the word. So that leads me on to look at this question of who is this God? This, what is this mystery we call God? And what, would the, as, what can we say in simple terms, that probably non-controversial terms, about what is this mystery we call God? You may know of the story of the little girl in kindergarten and they had a painting session and the kindergarten teacher was walking around admiring, as you do, you know, your own children and grandchildren and what a wonderful painting it is, it should be in the Tate Modern and all that. And um, so she stopped by one little girl and admired this, this creation and she said to the little girl, which was a fatal mistake, never ask a child this, she said, that's beautiful, Sarah, or whatever the child's name was, what is it? Never ask that, never. <laughs> Just an aside on that, I'll come back to the little girl. I once um, asked my daughter to scribble. She was just learning to write. She produced this scribble all over the page. And I made that mistake. I said, that's great, Kirsten. What does it mean? <laughs> and her answer verbatim was, I don't know what it means. I only rot it. <laughs> and I felt that, you know, I should have that as an inscription on every book I ever write. Don't ask me what it means. I only rot it. <laughs> But um, the little girl with the painting, so the, the teacher says, that's beautiful, what is it? And the little girl says, it's a picture of God. And the teacher says, now that's really interesting because nobody's ever seen God. So uh, nobody really knows what God looks like. God's looking down on us through the grid there. Oh, he's just walked away with his backpack, it's okay. <laughs> um, and so this is the teacher's answer. And then the little girl looks at her as only a little, girl, a little child can look at you and says, well, they will when I finish my picture. <laughs> so we have a lot of images of this God. 
we have the, um, and we know that they're only images, and we know that most of them are not helpful images. The Santa Claus God, for instance, the one who delivers everything we might ask for. Um, we just give God a list of the things on our wish list, and, and there they come, or don't, and then of course we have a crisis of faith. Or the Mr. Fix-It God, I use the Mr. Fix-It God a lot, I've often, in the past, and still do a bit, I, I see the problem, I work out the solution, I put it all there in my head, out there as a kind of business proposal to God, and all I ask God to do is deliver. Does God ever deliver? No, what God delivers is something wildly different from what you'd worked out. So Mr. Fix-It God isn't, um, isn't a very useful image. There's the policeman God or the strict head teacher God who's just waiting for you to make a mistake. And the, the, the more um, doctrinaire or punishment-oriented aspects of our faith traditions or uh, bits of our faith traditions it tend to produce people who are very fear-filled because of that very thing. One false step and you're out. A zero-tolerance God who is waiting to eliminate you from the kingdom. Um, What's that about? Usually it's a projection from our own childhood, from some experience of being excessively schooled and policed and um, so on. It's certainly not the mystery we call God. Then there's the, the, the God who finds a parking space. Now, Catholics are very good at that because they have saints for these things as well. And um, I'll tell you an Irish story, and I love, I do really, truly love the Irish, and they, they write their own jokes and they uh, we just import them as if we'd invented them and they tell stories like you wouldn't believe and some of you will surely know that. So this is a story told to me by an Irish person and I can't do the accent sadly, I wish I could, but so uh, this man is on his way in Dublin to, a, to a, an important meeting and needs a parking space so up go the hands, this is typical Irish prayer, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, I need it, I need a parking space, I've got to get to this meeting, nothing. So he decides to up the ante a bit. What will he do? How will he persuade this reluctant divinity? So he says, I need a parking space for this important meeting. You know how important this meeting is. If you find me a parking space, he says to God, I'll, what will I do, he thinks. Oh, sure, he says, I'll give up fornication. <laughs> Instantly, parking space comes free. Right in front of me. <laughs> so up go the hands again. It's okay, God, forget it, I've found one. <laughs> And yet, the strange thing is, we all know that now and again it works, you know, and yet, <laughs> I don't know, sometimes you think, well anyway, whatever, surely God, the, the, the one who holds billions and trillions of galaxies in, in orbit is, well, is, yeah, is not, well, is concerned about parking spaces, I don't know. A better image, though, than any of those, and it's not, it's still only an image, is one by the late Anthony de Mello, um, Japanese, Indian, sorry, Indian Jesuit, who wrote uh, lovely storybooks, parables. And one of his, you may well know this, is, uh, the, one of his stories is, it's an open-ended story, and it's about the fish swimming in the ocean. And the fish has heard a rumour about this entity, this mystery called ocean. And it's searching for this mystery. And so it asks the other fish that it meets, have, have, you, have you seen, oh, do you know about ocean? And the fish says, oh yes, everybody knows about ocean. Well, where is it? Oh, well, nobody knows where it is. Nobody's ever been there. Well, what does it look like? How will I recognize it when I find it? Well, nobody knows because nobody's ever seen it. So does the fish swim away having decided that ocean is just a figment of fishy imagination? Or does the fish swim away having realized that ocean is the very mystery in which it lives and moves and has its being? And I think for me as a person of faith, that would be my image, the, the image that's most helpful to me of God. It's a mystery in the mystery in whom I live and move and have my being. And I can no more be out of it and live in any meaningful way than a fish can live out of water or a, a bird can survive without the air. 
So even atheists, and I, su I suspect that most atheists, or people who call themselves atheists, are actually rejecting, and rightly rejecting, a flawed image of God. You can't reject the mystery in whom you live and move and have your being. It, it doesn't make any sense. Well, you know that, that lovely um, quote that you sometimes see, bidden or unbidden, God is here. I love that. That makes a lot of sense to me. So is there anything we can say about this mystery we call God? These are just things I would say that you don't have to, that you would have your own. You would have written this book yourself and all of you could have done in your own way. And it would have been, we would have had however many different books here. But one thing I want to say is, certainly God is mystery and what God is not, and this is a bit, could raise a few eyebrows, God is not a big, a big person like me, only much bigger and better and more powerful. And I got to a point where I personally have problems with that anthropomorphic view of God because there's all kinds of dangers in it that we, we project our, the whole human stuff onto this God. We assume that God has feelings and desires and, and preferences which align actually with our own and might be completely contradictory to the, the, the desires and needs and preferences of the person next door or the person in another country. Um, so I think there are a lot of dangers, but I can understand that we need a handle. And what else do you do except give this God a human handle? Uh, but it was quite a breakthrough and almost a breakdown for me to be able to say God is not a person like that. God is mystery. However, I want to qualify that straight away by saying, what can we say about this mystery? The first thing I would want to say about the mystery is it may not be a person, but it is profoundly personal because I think we know from our own experience this mystery impacts us, touches us, inspires us, warns us, nudges us in all kinds of ways, in very personal ways that are unique to us, but at the same time is in that same personal contact and relationship with everyone else. So forget the big man in the sky or the big whatever sexless person in the sky or the big, big person anywhere else, um, because that is a bit fraught with com complications, I think. But a, pers a mystery who is personally connecting with each of us, heart to heart, I would say. And that's already a bit more anthropomorphism, I know. But So the mystery is personal. And the mystery is also intentional. I believe, because it's going somewhere. The intention, what is the intention of this mystery we call God? Well, the intention is love, I think, but not the romantic 14th of February kind of love, and I'll look at that a bit more in a minute. The intention is love in that I would suggest that this mystery I call God is constantly striving to bring more and more fullness of life, as Jesus himself said, out of whatever we present. Just as a loving parent doesn't send the seven-year-old back to the, to the cradle because it get, he gets something wrong at school, you start with wherever the person is and draw them on from that point with bringing forth the maximum potential, the most loving possible outcome. So I would say, I can't name this mystery. This mystery is mystery and will always be mystery to me as a human being. But the mystery is personal, profoundly personal, uniquely personal, and is also intentional. In my life, I believe that God is striving to make the best of whatever messes I bring forth. And in our national life and our life on this planet, uh, the same thing applies. I, I believe that dynamic of goodness is striving to bring us towards something greater, which many would call consciousness evolution, um, moving towards higher and higher levels of consciousness which are making us more and more fully human and therefore more fully reflective of the glory of God. And I see it in the evolutionary story. That, that you look back and you see from four mil billion years ago, life on this planet, um, from the tiniest beginnings, the first single-celled organisms being 
gradually evolved into something more and more complex. And I don't think we've arrived. If we think we've arrived anywhere, we have almost certainly gone down a cul-de-sac, friends. People who know that they've arrived have somehow got blocked. Because to be a person of faith is to be on a journey, to be moving, to be growing, to be open to surprises. So um, God, God, one who is constantly striving and is, is himself, I'll use the pronoun, um, uh, the dynamic of love, the dynamic of life. And we, in our turn, long to be in right relationship with this God. And that's been the case long before Jesus came to the planet. Um, the earliest people, 12,000 years ago in Uluru in Australia, the, the Aboriginal people making their ceremonies, trying, longing to be in right relationship with this deeper mystery around which they wanted their lives to be lived. Um, the people in Ireland, in County Meath, the ancient burial uh, chambers were deliberately constructed 4,000 or more years ago so that the dawn light on the morning of the solstice would shine right through a small crack in the, in the construction and illuminate the entire inner chamber. That's a kind of sacrament. People saying, we know that the mystery is bigger than we are and we want to be in right relationship with that mystery. But relationship requires self-revelation. And it begins, I suggest, with God's self-revelation to us. Through creation, the first revelation, the natural world, through sacred scripture, through the universe story, through the lives of others, and especially the life of Jesus of Nazareth. And through all creative endeavors, um, whatever we're doing, whether we're writing a symphony or singing in the community choir, whether we're mixing a Christmas cake or doing a Nigella Lawson on TV cook shows. Um, all creative endeavors are fired by this mystery. And the events of our ordinary lives reveal that mystery. And we, in our turn, bring our concerns to God in prayer and hold them, as the Quakers say, hold them in the light just not trying to tell God what to do about them, but just holding with focused, loving intention and attention, holding these concerns in prayer. So, um, moving on rapidly, because we can't leave Jesus on, on, <laughs> unattended to. Um, <laughs> we are Christians, most of us in this room, I assume, anyway, are, are Christians. Very little is known. What can we say about Jesus of Nazareth that isn't going to cause a furore with some other denomination? Very little is known about Jesus of Nazareth. A lot more is believed. Um, we don't even know for sure what Jesus actually said. Scripture scholars, are, there's lots of questions, as I'm sure we all know. But uh, whatever is recorded in the Gospels, um, and I'd include also the non-canonical Gospels, the Gnostic Gospels, and because lots of wisdom in there, and you wonder why it was ruled out and what kind of a threat it posed at the time, but anyway. But one thing Jesus, we believe, said, um, or the spirit of the man said, was, um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And looking at that way, what could we say about that? If Jesus is the way, what could we... One thing, of course, it's, it's frequently put, Jesus is the way, meaning Jesus is the only way. I have difficulties with that, actually, and I must confess that. Not that I'm, a, I'm not a theologian, and so I'm out of my depth here completely, but um, I'd prefer to hear the, the uh, emphasis in that sentence slightly differently. I am the way, not the destination. Maybe, anyway, that's just a thought. But, but what is this way? Is there anything we can say that we might agree across all the divides? about what this way is, and I'd suggest three things. It's a way of, of love, it's a way of truth, and it's a way of life itself. A way of love, not the 14th of February kind, although that's important too, of course. A way of love, the most important, helpful thing I ever read about love was in a book by M. Scott Peck probably the road less traveled, I'm not sure now which one, where he says, love 
is not an emotion, love is a decision. And I found that so extraordinarily helpful because Jesus says, rather idealistically, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then goes on to say, love your enemies and do good to those who do harm to you. And that's a really hard one. It's impossible if you see it as an emotion. First of all, most of us don't actually love or even like ourselves very much. So what hope for the, the silly old bat next door? Um, what does it mean to love your neighbour? We had a very, we lived in Scotland for three years and we had a very harsh winter one year. And in the local news, there was a story of a, a lady, a young woman who lived next door to the neighbour from hell, an older lady who, a very old lady, a very grumpy old lady, who complained about everything. If the leaves from the neighbor's trees fell on her side of the fence, she complained. If the cat peed on her lawn, she complained. That kind of a neighbor, you know? So there was no love lost between them until the winter came. And then this old lady got snowed in. She couldn't get her car out of the drive. She couldn't walk because she would have broken her bones if she had. So the younger woman thought to herself, I can't let her starve. Um, so she went round and asked, did she need anything? And that developed over a few weeks from bringing in a bit of shopping to bringing around a casserole, sharing a cup of tea and a cake. And by the time the snow melted, their relationship had also thawed because the younger woman had chosen and decided, she'd made a decision to do the more loving thing, regardless of how she felt. Um, you can apply that to enemies in 1944, in Red Square, Moscow, some German prisoners of war were being marched through Red Square in triumph, I suppose, or it, 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 whatever. They were in chains, they were in a terrible state. And they, because so many people in Russia, as we all know, had lost, everybody had lost somebody. And so the hatred and the fury and the rage against these, there they were, there in their hands, these people, these men, what would they do? So they had cordons to hold them back, the crowds back, so that they wouldn't actually mob these men. So the, this is a true story, well documented, you probably know it. So they come marching through the offices first and they were jeered and spat at and so on. They were still in fairly decent uniforms. And then the men came through, the ordinary soldiers, battered, exhausted, starving, terrified, some in chains, wounded on crutches and so on. And a complete silence fell over Red Square. And then one woman in the crowd looked into the eyes of one of these prisoners of war and saw a starving human being and thought to herself, I've got some bread in the kitchen, not much, but I've got a bit. She went back, got a bit of bread, broke through the cordon and gave it to one of these prisoners of war. And when she did that, a lot of other people in the crowd saw that and did the same. Now, it didn't mean they were feeling all warm and fuzzy about these people because they were quite possibly the very men who in previous weeks and months had killed their husbands, sons, lovers, brothers, etc. But they didn't feel that emotion, but they chose to do the more loving thing. Now, that's a long time ago. Whether we could still do that if we met the guy with the London accent who goes around doing his d dirty work for IS, I don't know. I, well, I do know, actually. I know I couldn't. But I think Jesus is asking us to work from what is the more loving thing to do next, rather than how do I feel. So a way of love which is hugely challenging. A way of truth, not just who has got the truth right, who has got the absolute truth, which denomination has got it right, not that kind of truth. The kind of truth that you feel in your heart when you know when you're living true to the best you can be, and more, much more frequently you know when you're not. And that challenge to live more and more consistently true to that axis of truth within us. I suggest, as a Christian, Jesus of Nazareth lived totally in alignment with that deep truth in the core of his being, so that everything he said and did 
and even thought was in alignment with Abba, the Father. Um, we are usually out of alignment, but the, the call of our faith is to live more and more increasingly in alignment with that. Um, and the way of life, I believe that this is pointing us to everything we can be. It's actually the future of evolution, uh, the spiritual evolution, as Teilhard de Chardin speaks of. Uh, we are on a journey to something beyond what we are now. But how we get there and what it is that we're shaping as we go is left to us. It's in our hands. And the, let me put this to you, the currency of transformation into who we can best be is not in the big things but in the small change, in every decision we make, in every action we take. And every choice that we make along the way matters. It's impossible. It will either add to the store of love, truth, and hope in the world, or it will diminish that store. I don't think it's possible to be neutral. And the, the cost of living this challenge we see in Calvary, where light shines, where even our little lights shine, they will provoke a, a, re a reaction, and the darkness will fight back. And yet I believe Jesus lives it, lives this truth, and dies it, and then transcends the destruction of the cross in resurrection, and says to us, live it with me, risk it, get in the wheelbarrow, trust it, and I'll show you what it means to live it, and I'll show you what it can cost. And you know, just whistleblowers, or someone who puts their hand up and says, I don't think this is right, We'll get a lot of opposition. We all know that. Um, I think Jesus warns us about that. Um, and yet, that opposition, even when it completely destroys us. Oh dear, I haven't got to the illusions yet. <laughs> okay, better go, come to us. We're going to have to finish with Jesus, friends. But, um, but to, uh, to walk that way is the most challenging thing we could ever be asked to do. I'll finish then with a little story from my daughter's graduation ceremony. Medical school, Newcastle on Tyne, and several different graduation ceremonies because lots of new graduates. So the dean is giving out the certificates and asking the new graduates, just in passing, little questions like, have you enjoyed your time here? What are you going to do now? So, and then afterwards he told us about some answers he'd had in previous ceremonies. So one person he said had come up what are you going to do now? Congratulations, and what are you going to do now? And this person has said, I'm going to be a leading neuroscientist. I'm going to push the boundaries of neurosurgery and have my offices in Harley Street. And so the dean had said, congratulations on you, your uh, graduation. I wish you every success in your career. And then a few graduates later on, somebody else had come up, what are you going to do next? And this person had said, after a bit of thought, I'm going to turn left and walk very carefully down these three steps. <laughs> and so, I, I put it to you, friends, we are engaged in something much bigger than pushing the boundaries of neurosurgery, important though that would be. We are called to bring God's dream to birth on this planet of ours in some way, to live the kingdom and make it real. That's huge. And how are we going to do that? By attending to the next three steps. The next three conversations, the next decisions, the next choices, the next interaction we have. So I better leave it there or they'll throw me out. And I don't want to be thrown out of St Paul's Cathedral. So thank you very much, friends. So we'll... Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. What I suggest we do is that we just give Margaret a moment to take a breath um, before we open up the conversation amongst ourselves. So could I encourage you to do something we do do here from time to time, which is to turn to a neighbour and to just for a, a minute or two share together something about our initial responses to what we've heard. Um, what stood out for us? Um, were there things that perplexed us and challenged us? What might be some of those next steps for us? So, please would you do that, turn to a neighbour, 
start to explore and hopefully that will be a catalyst then for some of the questions you might want to share amongst ourselves. So please go ahead. A conversation has been unleashed and now I feel that I'm drawing us together, but only so that we can continue. So let me just ask, who, who would like to start us off with a question? If you raise your hands, I'll, I'll pull you out. Yes, right at the back. I just want to say how much I appreciate the humour that you brought. Because it seems to me that's one of the ways we resolve the contradictions in life. Um, right. And I'd also get into the sad story because you kept speaking about what children have taught you. And just at my local school, they put a huge wall up around where the little preschoolers play. And I asked why that was done. And the woman from the school said, oh, child protection, child protection, because it will protect children. It's so sad because there's a woman who has Alzheimer's and she comes out each day with a cup of tea and sees the children and watches the children. Now she can't. Oh, and I think yeah. that the, the, the sort of way in which we, this is the control thing, the fear thing, and we're not yes. a child, that's what you reminded me of. You look at a child, you see that mystery. Don't you? Yeah, yes, yes, you do. A child teaches us yes. how to respond. Yes. So thank you for reminding me of that. Oh. Thank you, that's lovely. It's sad when protection becomes imprisonment, isn't it? Um, for the children's sake as well as for the rest, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, humour is so important if we don't... And Jesus must have been laughing all the time. Well, not all the time, but he must have laughed a, no, a great deal more. We're so pan-faced about it, you know. The, uh, you can, we say, you know, it's easier for a camel to enter the kingdom than whatever, you know, go with a camel through the eye of a needle. Surely he was laughing when he said that. Tongue in cheek and cheek in tongue. <laughs> so, yeah, let's, let's lighten up as well as deepening down, you know. Thank you. Yes, let's start at the front and then the um, Following Master Eckhart, would you? us to get rid of Jesus. <laughs> well, I think he says, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, grapes of wrath. The pastor says, I, don't, I only know stories about Jesus, but I look at people's faces. Uh, right. Somebody showed me um, a piece of art recently of a figure of Jesus, but a completely blank face and that looking into that blank face and seeing Jesus in a thousand, as Jared Manley Hopkins yes, says, exactly. in a thousand exactly. faces. Exactly. Um, I think my step got suggested getting rid of God and the didn't the Buddha say if you meet the Buddha on the street kill him? Because you, it, it's, you're looking at some image that you've sort of projected if you do meet that. Um, I wouldn't get rid of Jesus. I really will stand up here and say no, let's please not get rid of Jesus. We've done that once and he didn't go away. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but maybe some of the mythology, uh, well, is it mythology? Um, Richard Raw, the um, American Franciscan, once said in Liverpool Cathedral, and to some people's consternation, he said, I challenge anyone here to tell me, show me anywhere in the Gospels where Jesus says, worship me, but I'll show you 20 places where he says, follow me. Don't let the worshipping of someone who you have put up on a pedestal, because of course he is up there, I know that, um, don't let that become the best excuse you'll ever find not to follow. So I would want to say, let's focus on the following. Just what is Jesus? Well, yes, who is Jesus? And, and that, huge questions, but I see the story that we've been handed down, and I see in that story, let me put, I'll say this, and I might cause ructions in the hierarchy, but. I see in all the stories that we have, and canonical or otherwise, someone I want and need to follow, and I don't actually care who his parents were. <laughs> I have said it. Shoot now. <laughs> because we can't know somebody 2,000 years ago except through personal encounter in prayer now. Um, but. Yeah, for me as a Christian, but the following becomes very much complicated if you're surrounded by all the doctrinal stuff and the practices that you might deeply disagree with and all sorts of stuff. So um, let's not get rid of him, but let's 
yeah, let's maybe change our view. And another thing I'd say about Jesus, and this is one of the illusions, is um, it's easy to get the impression from outside that Jesus is God's plan B, who came to put things right when we, puny little humanity on one little rock in a fairly obscure galaxy among trillions of galaxies, that we, do we really believe, had the power to subvert the divine dream for life? That's a terrible arrogance. And so God doesn't need a plan B. And I know theology says Jesus is there from the beginning and so on. The word, in the beginning the word was. But um, the focus is always backwards looking in our liturgies. It's save us from this thing in the past, which none of us actually knows what we did. But um, I, I suggest that the emphasis is more helpful to look forward. Jesus reveals what we can be, the human being fully alive. And, and how to perhaps move towards that, following his example, and empowered by his spirit. Um, so, to change the emphasis a bit. But to make that journey forward means radically reassessing where we are. So there is a metanoia involved, big time. Um, so, but uh, if we're going to get rid of anything, can I propose getting rid of original sin? Yeah. <laughs> Put that to the vote. Put that to the vote, okay. <laughs> Original blessing, yes, absolutely, yes, yes, original creation, yeah. And can we come to you with patience? Oh, sorry. Yeah, you spoke a lot about uh, the, the mystery of the faith and this idea um, of accepting that it is a mystery and that we cannot really know. Um, what would your suggestion be if you look at, at our society today, um, and especially me personally as a young Christian when I engage with conversations with other students or, mm -hmm. or other people, there's always Everyone seeks this truth, and a lot of people mm. deny faith because they cannot know it. Yes. So why should I believe in it? And this yeah. idea of truth, of scientific and material truth yes. we have today, seems to um, drive a lot of people towards, from my perspective, the wrong things. Sure. It's materialism. Yeah. How can we reignite this conversation yeah. about what truth is and what we should look for, especially yeah. um, today? Because I have the feeling. Faith, um, especially among younger people, seems to be ridiculed. How can you write yes. something which is just in a book written ages ago and nobody knows whether yeah. it's true or not? Yes. Um, yeah, what would your suggestion be? How can yeah. you this conversation about what truth actually is and, and what faith is? It's a very central question, and Jesus asked it of Pilate, what is truth? Um, and of course, religion, of all, in all its shades, tends to settle on certain uh, academic, you know, intellectual assents to things. Um, what I do when I'm leading retreats sometimes is I, I say, although with my head, I would have to say I'm an agnostic. What do I know? Very little about Jesus and nothing really about God. And so does this mystery that has no name and uh, this presence, this whatever this dynamic is, have a son, what does that mean? All those things don't mean anything, really. You don't know anything. But there's another, there are other levels of knowing. And I suggest to people, and it's certainly true for me, there's, a, there's, there's some things I know with an absolute certainty, and nobody can take that certainty away from me, because I, you won't necessarily find much resonance with other students here, but I say to people, when, have you, when do you feel you actually felt the touch of something other on your life, the mystery? That might have been when you felt guided in some way when you were in a mess and you didn't know what to do, but clarity emerged and you didn't know quite where it came from. Or some support was forthcoming when you didn't expect it and it came perhaps from a, a quarter you didn't expect it from. Or you were taken out of yourself by a beautiful experience in the created world, for instance, or a piece of music, or, or a deep human relationship, when there is genuinely the experience of ecstasy standing outside the ego self. Um, and for me, those are moments when we know, and nobody in the world can say that that's imagination, because you know what you know, and it's not written in any books. And so I, but not necessarily, I've not done it with young people, but I would encourage people to um, get in touch with those moments of genuine, authentic certainty that they were 
somehow held in orbit around a deeper center. Or they might not express it like that. And I'd also say, coming back to what you said about seeing other people, seeing Jesus in other people's faces, Jesus once said to John the Baptist, John the Baptist is there in prison, he's about to lose his head, and um, and he says, he sends a message to Jesus. You know, I've staked my whole life on you. It's, are you the real deal? Are you the one we were expecting? Or are we still waiting? Fair question. And he thought Jesus might have said, carry on, lad, you're doing fine. But no. He says, if you want to know the answer to your question, look around you. Where do you see it being lived? And for me, that would be what I would ask of people who say, but this isn't, you can't prove this. You can't, you can't measure love. You, can't, well, you can measure electricity, but you can't see it. I believe in lots of things that I can't see and can't measure. But when I see the, the gospel being lived around me, I see it in the most unlikely places and people who would never darken the doors of a church and wouldn't assent to uh, the creeds or anything like that. But they're living the kind of dynamic of love that Jesus lived. Um, and I mentioned uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, people like that. Or just people who are out there on the streets of London doing stuff. Or quietly helping their neighbours. Uh, you see it all the time. And I would direct people to that. Where do you see love being lived, real love, the decision love, being lived out? That would be the kind of truth I would want to be emphasising. But good luck. <laughs> Uh, just you mentioned a book about uh, from a theologian about the um, evolution of the spirit. Of yeah, Teilhard de Chardin. He's a 9th, 20th century um, Jesuit, he was, but he was a paleontologist primarily. And he was uh, silenced by the church and by the Jesuits in his day. But he speaks, he wouldn't, it's not easy to read, and he would um, not necessarily use the same language now, but he speaks of an evolution of spirit, that we've, we are evolving physically, but we may be slowing down in our physical evolution, like maybe in two generations we'll be born with microchips in our ears that immediately Google out everything, I don't know, God help us. But, but physical evolution may be coming, slowing down, but he believed, and he's not the only one, people like Brian Swim, Thomas Berry, Dermot O'Merk, who lots of people are writing now about um, the evolution of consciousness, and that even were the worst to happen, that, that human life extinguishes itself on this planet, who knows whether consciousness evolution is the next stage? I, I don't know. That's pure speculation. But, um, but it's worth looking into that. Um, maybe finding someone a bit more accessible than Teilhard de Chardin, but it, he's worth a look, certainly. Because young people know that that, that that makes sense to them, that because they're part of it, they're, they're the accelerating part of the growing consciousness. I may deplore some of the aspects of social media networks, but they are moving towards this oneness of intercommunication, interdependence, and non-hierarchical structures. These are all signs of the future, I think. So, lots more one could say. There is lots more that we would love to hear from you, but it's again my um, responsibility to uh, draw us to a close. I'm so sorry that there is not more time uh, for questions, and I can see desperate hands going up at the back. Um, I did want to just conclude by saying at the very beginning, Margaret, I mentioned that you're the author of a number of what are described as spiritual guides uh, or guides for the spiritual journey. And having recently just been walking with a guide, um, I've realized that the very best guides point out new things. Um, they point out new things about things that you already thought you knew. But the very best guides actually invite you to make your own discoveries. And that's certainly true of you and has been true of you this afternoon. So thank you so much for all you've shared. And as you've heard, there's far more we would want to know. Um, I'm really delighted to say that Margaret's agreed to be here for a few moments um, to sign books. So if you want to pick up a book, um, she'll be here. We're very grateful for you for that. Um, but we do thank you for all you've brought and for all that you're now encouraging us to go and discover for ourselves. So could you please join with me in thanking Margaret for today? <laughs>